I was so psyched when I finally got a drone for my birthday after wanting one forever. I had dreams of filming epic videos and taking super cool aerial photos. My parents got me a decent starter one with an HD camera and pretty far range. The first place I wanted to try it out was over my neighborhood. I figured that would be a good place to practice before taking it anywhere crazy. Plus, I was curious to see my house and stuff from high above. It was a really nice day with perfect blue skies, so conditions were ideal for drone flying. In my backyard, I did all the startup steps, then sent the drone soaring into the air. It was so awesome to see everything get smaller as the drone climbed higher. Soon I had a bird's eye view of the whole neighborhood laid out below. I could spot kids playing in their yards, people mowing lawns, cars going by. I practiced maneuvering it around, filming clips of streets and houses. Then I had it hover right over my place so I could check out our roof and see if my basketball hoop was bent from this angle. After messing around for a while, I decided to see how far I could make it go. I pushed the joystick forward, sending the drone over the trees into the next street. The camera image remained clear even at that distance. One house looked massive from above with a huge pool and garden. I realized it was my next door neighbor, Mr. Carter's place. He was kind of a mysterious guy who kept to himself. Looking at his house made me curious what I could see of his life from the air. I navigated the drone right over his yard, keeping it high enough to not be noticed. His property was much bigger than it seemed from the street. The large backyard had tons of flower gardens, a guest house, and a huge patio perfect for entertaining but the yard was empty at the moment. I maneuvered the drone, scanning the whole estate for any activity. Finally, I spotted movement near the far back corner. Mr. Carter was sitting on a nice patio set up away from the house. In front of him was a fancy large grill. Looked like he was just having a casual barbecue on this nice day. Nothing too weird about that. However, I did find it odd he was grilling in the backyard instead of closer to the kitchen in the patio area. Seemed like kind of a hassle to carry all the cooked food so far. But maybe he just liked the privacy. I shouldn't spy on my neighbor, I thought. But I couldn't help being intrigued. I zoomed the camera in closer, trying to see what he was cooking up. The angle was partially blocked by trees, so I brought the drone in lower and closer, hiding it above the roof line in case he looked up. Finally, I had a clear shot of the grill. But what I saw made my stomach turn. Mr. Carter was working intently over the flames, but this was no normal barbecue. He was grilling what were very clearly two human arms rotating on spits over the hot coals. I recoiled back from the controller screen in shock. What the hell? Was this some sick joke? Adrenaline coursing through me, I forced myself to look again. Sure enough, unmistakable human limbs were browning over the fire. Nearby on a table was a large carving knife and various saws. My hands started shaking, realizing I had a serial killer for a neighbor. I should have flown the drone away right then, but morbid fascination kept me watching this horrific scene unfold. After thoroughly cooking the arms, he carved chunks of meat off the bones. Then he laid the pieces out almost ceremonially on a platter garnished with vegetables like a fancy restaurant meal. My brain couldn't process this nightmare. I sat there frozen, unsure what to do. Should I immediately call the cops? Fly over for proof? Confront him? I didn't want to become this psycho's next victim. As I agonized over how to handle this, Mr. Carter abruptly looked straight up in my direction, as if sensing he was being watched. I panicked and crashed the drone back into my yard before he could spot it. My mind and heart were racing. What was going on in that house of horrors next door? How many people had fallen prey to my neighbor's monstrous appetites? And what could I possibly do to stop him that wouldn't put my own life at risk? I paced around my room, wrestling with whether to tell my parents. Would they even believe something so insane? Calling the police seemed just as nuts without solid evidence. And I shuddered, imagining what Mr. Carter might do if he found out I discovered his secret. In the end, I decided I had to do something, even if it meant putting myself in danger. I couldn't live next door to a cannibalistic murderer and do nothing. Once night fell, I was going to sneak over there and find proof to show the police. As I plotted out a plan, I realized just how little I actually knew about my reclusive neighbor. He had lived there as long as I could remember. No family that I'd seen, never hosted parties or had friends over. Kept completely to himself. Was that how he had gotten away with murder for so long? Taking people who wouldn't be missed, 
A chill ran through me as I stared out at his home looming in the darkness just steps from mine. Around midnight, when all the houses were silent and the streets empty, I crept outside dressed in dark clothes. I didn't dare take my drone to avoid any noise giving me away. If I could just get some photos through the windows, I'd have enough proof. Heart pounding, I crossed between our yards using the trees for cover. His house remained still and quiet. I hoped that meant he was asleep and wouldn't discover me snooping outside. Reaching his side yard, I crouched below the windows, moving slowly so my shadow wouldn't alert him. The amount of sheer terror I felt at that moment was unreal. What I was doing was crazy dangerous, but it was too late to turn back now. I had to know the truth about my neighbor. Carefully standing up, I peered into the first dark window. My breath fogged the cold glass as I strained to see anything inside. It looked like a normal kitchen. Too dark to make out much detail. No signs of human remains or anything incriminating that I could see. I crept to the next window, hoping for a better view. As I leaned close, a bright light suddenly flooded the glass. I dropped down, my heart exploding in my chest. Had he seen me? I waited motionless for any sign I'd been caught. No shouts or footsteps came. After what seemed like ages, I slowly peered back in the window. Mr. Carter walked into the fully lit room carrying a plate and a glass of wine. He sat at a neatly set table and began eating his meal. But it wasn't human flesh this time, just a normal looking steak and veggies. I watched in stunned confusion. Maybe I had imagined the earlier horror show after all. But no, the image was burned into my mind. This was definitely the same man, but now just having a regular meal. I shook my head, second-guessing everything. None of this made any sense. How could he go from cannibal to normal family dinner on the same day? Desperate for answers, I decided to break into the guest house and search it for clues while he was preoccupied eating. I couldn't go to the cops without something tangible. The small back house was dark and empty inside. I turned on my phone flashlight and began rifling quietly through drawers and cabinets, but found nothing out of the ordinary. No bones, weapons, or human remains. What the hell was going on? I froze as I heard a floorboard creak behind me. Whipping around, I shone my light in Mr. Carter's face as he stood in the doorway. I don't know what you think you saw, but I suggest you leave before you regret it, he said coldly before turning and walking away as if nothing had happened. My legs wobbled beneath me, unsure whether to stay or flee, but his chilling tone made the choice clear. I ran home faster than I'd ever run in my life collapsed in bed and stayed locked inside for days. Soon after, my parents said we were moving. They gave no reason why, but I knew it was because of my insane neighbor. I never figured out what exactly Mr. Carter was doing, and I didn't want to know. All I can say is keep an eye on the people around you. Monsters are scarily good at blending in. I never really believed in ghosts or the paranormal, until I started working the night shift as an orderly at an old hospital. Everything changed for me in the winter of 2009. That was the year the blizzard hit and trapped me overnight with just one other staff member and a handful of patients. I was 21 years old and eager to prove myself at my new job. Sure, Falls Memorial Hospital had a bit of a reputation. People said it was haunted, that if you wandered the halls late at night, you'd hear cries and whimpers from forgotten souls. But I figured they were just stories made up to mess with the new guys. Still, I did my best to always stick with others at night. The night the blizzard hit, the roads had gotten bad fast. Most of the evening staff were sent home early to get home safely. My supervisor asked if I could stay until morning to cover the shift with just one nurse named Janelle. She said the overnight doctor was already in-house and there were only a few patients who needed monitoring. When my relief didn't show up the next morning due to the storm, I started getting a little nervous. The wind howled outside and tossed sheets of freezing snow, making the old building creak and moan. During rounds with Janelle, some of the patients seemed agitated, complaining of hearing cries and footsteps in the night. But when we checked the halls and rooms, they were of course empty. Janelle and I hunkered down that night, checking on patients and trying to ignore the strange noises. Some sounded like knocks and squeaking wheels from gurneys being moved around but the hallways remained still and deserted, just the fluorescent lights humming. I fought back a constant chill creeping up my neck. During a brief power outage, I volunteered to patrol the floor alone with a flashlight while Janelle stayed at the nurse's station with battery-powered lamps. 
As I shone the light down the dreary hallways, hearing the wind batter the window panes, I couldn't shake the growing feeling of not being alone. Turning a corner, I caught movement at the end of the hall and hurried towards it. I was sure I had seen the hem of a white coat disappearing around the bend up ahead. The beam of my flashlight carved through the darkness as I picked up my pace. But when I reached the spot, there was no one there. Just endless empty corridor before me. I backtracked, searching for any sign of an errant doctor or nurse I might have glimpsed. Nearing a patient's room, I realized the door was now cracked open, though I was certain I'd shut it earlier. Gripping the flashlight, I nudged the door and peered inside. The room was still, the patient sleeping curled away from me in the bed. As I pulled the door quietly closed, a bone-chilling draft swirled down the hall, lifting the hair on my arms. The beam of my flashlight flickered and went out, plunging me into complete darkness. I clicked the button frantically, but no light came on. As I stood there blind and heart-hammering, a slow creak sounded behind me, followed by a weak, raspy whimper. The horrible sound raised goosebumps on my skin. My stomach lurched, and I broke into a cold sweat. Stumbling in darkness, I made it back to the nurse's station. Janelle asked what was wrong when she saw the look on my face. When the backup lights flickered on, I tried to explain, but she said I was just letting my imagination run away with me. But I knew what I had heard and felt. When my replacement finally arrived the next morning, I felt weak with relief. But driving home in the blinding snow, I couldn't dismiss the haunting events of that night. Nor could I erase the moment I glimpsed that empty corridor littered with gurneys and patients silently writhing in their beds, a scene from some past decade bleeding into my reality. After that night, I requested to only workday shifts, but occasionally I still feel an unnatural chill when entering one of the older wards and catch whispers from around a corner. Whether haunted or not, some places never fully let go of their past. I don't think I'll ever forget that night we decided to explore the old abandoned Danford Asylum on the edge of town. It had only been closed down for a couple of years at that point, but already had this seriously creepy reputation. Of course that made it tempting to a bunch of dumb teenagers like us looking for thrills. We snuck in there expecting some good ghost story material, but what we found was way more twisted than any made-up spook house. It was a weekend, and me and my buddies were hanging out bored like usual. That's when my friend Jake brought up the recently shut down asylum just outside of town. He said he heard the place was still fully furnished, with patient records and equipment and everything left behind when it closed. I gotta admit I was curious what we might find in there, and a little nervous too. Even though it had only been closed a couple years, the Danford Asylum had developed this ominous reputation. Rumors of unethical experiments, abusive staff, and patient misery and suffering within those walls. But peer pressure is a powerful thing, and soon I agreed to check it out along with the others. We got our supplies together and headed over at sunset. I felt my stomach knot up as the abandoned building came into view. It was this imposing brick structure, the windows still intact, surrounded by a chain-link fence with warning signs. As crazy as it sounds, going in there felt like walking straight into a monster's lair. Of course, getting inside was scarily easy. A section of fence had been pulled loose, so we slipped through into the grounds. The front entrance was chained shut, but we found a side door someone had jimmied open. My hands were shaking as I clicked on my flashlight and stepped into the dark hallway beyond. Our footsteps echoed eerily through the maze of corridors. It was like being in one of those apocalypse movies where you're exploring an abandoned bunker or something. Definitely creepy. Still, Jake and the others oohed and awed at the relics of the asylum's past life. The beds still neatly made, nurses' stations still cluttered with equipment, and wheelchairs lined up along one wall. But it felt wrong somehow. Like all the pain and misery from this place's history had seeped into the very walls. The deeper we went, the stronger my urge to run became. But I stayed close to my friends and kept my mouth shut. After almost an hour of wandering, we came to the staff office area. Desks and filing cabinets still strewn with paperwork. Jake started rifling through the documents with enthusiasm. I hung back, nervous to even touch anything, but he pulled out a thicker file labeled Patient 218 and started telling us this guy's crazy story. A deeply unstable patient, apparently. Prone to violent outbursts and delusions. 
The staff had been deeply concerned he might hurt someone if he ever escaped. As it turned out, he did manage to escape not long before the hospital closed down, and they never found him. I swear I almost pissed myself right then and there. This place already had me jumping at every stray noise or shadow down the hall. Finding out an actual homicidal maniac had been here, had walked these very halls, was too much. I was ready to take my chances sprinting for the exit alone. But once more, Jake and the others prodded me on like the idiots they were. The others seemed excited about this, but I have to admit my curiosity was starting to be outweighed by my growing unease. This place was seriously giving me the creeps, but I still didn't speak up as Jake grabbed a bunch of the folders and started rifling through them. I wandered over to the desk in the corner. There were still pens and papers scattered across it like the person working there had just stepped away for a minute. I absently opened the drawers, not expecting to find anything. But in the top drawer, tucked under a bunch of dusty paperwork, was a small leather journal. I picked it up and brushed off the cover. It looked totally out of place, like it had been left behind recently. I glanced at my friends who were still engrossed in the files. For some reason, I felt compelled to slip the journal into my jacket pocket before anyone noticed. I tried to focus on what Jake was saying, but my mind kept wandering to the journal now hidden in my pocket. Something about it seemed almost familiar, but I shook off the uneasy feeling and tuned back into the conversation. The others murmured uncomfortably and I felt my stomach twist into knots. I didn't like this. I wanted to get out of this place and fast. Just then we heard a loud crash from somewhere below us that made us all jump. Whoa, what was that? said Jake. We all stared at each other with wide eyes. Part of me hoped one of my friends would suggest leaving, but instead Jake said what I was dreading. We should go check it out. Everyone hesitated at first, but soon curiosity won out again and we headed toward the source of the noise. We took the stairs down to the basement level walking as quietly as we could. The deeper we went, the worse the feeling in the pit of my stomach became. Finally, we reached the basement. Our flashlight beams scanned the dark room, landing on overturned tables and equipment that was strewn across the floor. We picked our way through cautiously until we found the source of the noise, an old gurney that had tipped over near the far wall. Jake walked over and righted the gurney. That's when Jess gasped and pointed at the floor by the wall. Scrawled there in what looked like red paint were the words, Get out! I swear my heart stopped for a full second. This was not just some harmless abandoned building. Something seriously messed up was going on and we needed to leave. Right. Now. But once again, my so-called friends ignored my pleas to get out of there and insisted on investigating further. As we ventured deeper into the dark basement, I considered making a break for it and running back to the exit by myself. Before I could, Jake called out that he had found something else. We rushed over, flashing our lights on the ground where Jake was pointing. Spray painted on the concrete were the words, I see you, along with an arrow pointing directly at me. I stumbled back in shock. What the hell was going on? Was this some kind of twisted joke? My friends eyed me nervously and I could tell they were finally starting to freak out too. That's when I heard it. The faint sound of footsteps shuffling somewhere close by. My blood turned to ice. Someone was down here with us. I spun around wildly, shining my light through the blackness. Then a figure stepped into the faint glow, a hunched shadow of a man, his eyes reflecting the light back at me like an animal's. Chaos erupted. My friends screamed and we all turned and ran blindly, following our bobbing flashlights through the maze of corridors. The sound of shuffling footsteps followed close at our heels. When we made it to the stairs, I risked a glance back and gasped. The figure stood motionless halfway down the hall, staring after me. His face was obscured by stringy hair, but I could swear he was smiling. We scrambled back up the stairs, not stopping until we were outside gulping the fresh air. As we sprinted for the fence, I risked one last look at the foreboding Danford Asylum, now silent as a grave. The shadowy figure was gone, but I couldn't shake the twisted feeling that he was still watching me somewhere. We didn't really talk about what happened as we quickly headed home. The whole thing seemed too surreal and terrifying to process. As soon as I got in my room I sank down on my bed, my heart still pounding. After calming myself down a bit, I suddenly remembered the journal. I pulled it from my pocket with trembling hands, almost scared of what I might find inside. I slowly opened the cover and began reading the first page. What I saw made my blood freeze all over again. 
It was some kind of twisted diary written by patient 218, the unstable psych patient who had escaped from the Danford Asylum just before it closed. Every entry was written in frantic scrawl, some smeared as if stained with water or blood. As I read on in horror, the entries became more and more unhinged. Patient 218 wrote extensively about the object of his obsession, the person he focused all his deranged energy on. He never wrote a name, only referring to them as my special one. I felt bile rise up in my throat. With a shaking hand, I turned to one of the last entries. There, scribbled in a shaky, eager script, were the words, I will find my special one again. I must see the fear in their eyes. I will make them pay for leaving me here in this dark place. Beneath it was today's date and the chilling words. My special one came back to me.